This is how the next foreclosure crisis happens. Welcome back to Real Estate Mindset. I have Melody Wright with us today to go over basically all of today's data in, with regards to foreclosure, the process of foreclosure, and we're going to compare that to what was happening during the GFC. I've been hearing more and more videos about how there was millions of foreclosures that hit the market when the reality was, is yes, there was millions of people that were struggling, but those homes didn't necessarily turn to inventory. And so guys, before I begin, don't forget to go to Melody Wright's YouTube channel, Melody Wright. She has some wonderful videos. She's very heavy in data and balance and perspective, and she is a survivor of the great financial crisis, just like me. And don't forget, guys, she is a writer, very beautiful writing. Go to her sub stack, Melody Wright sub stack, especially if you want to support her and I going around metro areas, but very, very good stuff here. I uh, kind of want to begin, Melody, you know, with the first question, which is, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Travis. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm doing really well. So um, appreciate you being here, Melody. I'm looking forward to our road trip we're about to go on. Very excited about that. But, Me too. you know, first question, I, you know, we're going to paint a picture for the viewers. We'll try to do this as quickly as possible to really get a good context for what's going on now and how a foreclosure crisis would develop. But can you talk about, you know, to the viewers, since you are behind the scenes dealing with this stuff personally, you know, what would you say, you know, is the most accurate foreclosure data source? Where can we get foreclosure info? Yeah, so, you know, this is a good question and a much harder question to answer because, you know, I, I would I would say Black Knight today today for what we have today has the best data because they have 80% of all servicing. The problem is they don't tell you who they have and who they don't have. And so it can be very misleading. Like for instance, if you look at something like Inside Mortgage Finance, which is, um, a, you know, a, they, it's a hefty subscription you have to pay. And you can see folks on there like FCI, um, the, that's a servicer that services private notes, um, non-QM or non-qualified mortgage. And they have over a 34% delinquency. Is that in Black Knight's data? We don't know. And so that's that's the problem. They're missing 20%. And that 20% could be very important because they're missing some of the largest servicers. But in terms of best data, they have some, per, they have, mo, the, you know, the most comprehensive. And then there's, you know, Adam, A-T-T-O-M. I like them because they, they, pull from county records, Black Knight doesn't do that. They're just relying on uh, mortgage data. And so, you know, that's also the problem because, and, and something, you know, Travis, you and I, maybe while we're on the road, we can maybe do is look at the Adam numbers versus Black Knight because, you know, not everybody has a mortgage. And the one thing that we saw is these in quotation mark, all cash sales that we know were leveraged elsewhere. Um, and so when I'm looking at a city specifically, I'll often also use Realty Track, R E A L T Y uh, T R A C for number of foreclosures. Um, and then, you know, there's some really good paid services like um, Property Radar, and I'm not, they're not a sponsor or anything, uh, but you can find a whole bunch of great foreclosure data. And, you know, I think that's probably something now that this is actually, now we're actually seeing default, Travis, you know, for the longest time. It just was a nothing burger, as we know. But now that we're seeing it, we probably want to try and tie some of these sources because I guarantee you that even today, because Black Knight's only talking about mortgages, their uh, delinquents, their foreclosure information is going to be um, not comprehensive, as comprehensive as what's actually getting filed out there. And the other thing I noticed re recently, because I just recently got access to some of the source data for Black Knight, is that when you look at that delinquency rate, they actually exclude foreclosures. Why would they do that? That's interesting. So it, well, it's, it's 30, <laughs> 60, 90. So they include in their delinquency rate that you see in that mortgage monitor that you and I mm -hmm. always talk about, um, but they're excluding their foreclosures in the delinquency rate. Mm -hmm. So mm. right now, if you added the foreclosures back in, they reported something like a 3.44 for April. But if you add those foreclosures back in, it's more of a 4.04 percent. Unbelievable. I didn't, you know, I didn't realize that the delinquency rate that they're calculating was not including foreclosures. And I'm assuming, Melody, it's also not including the people that are still in the COVID forbearance programs, which is 
320,000. I'm assuming that's also not included in the default rate. They say they do, that they inc- they include those as delinquent, but they're not reported to credit as de- delinquent, obviously, when they're in forbearance. Okay. Well, not All obviously. Right, um, People may not know that, but <laughs> and so, but yeah, they, the forbearances should be in there. Okay. So, I mean, it's fair to say that Black Knight is got a big, big chunk of the pie as far as what has happened with foreclosures, what's happening now. Maybe they don't have the full 100%, but up to about 80%, at least of the data. Uh, so they're fairly accurate, but not a, a perfectly accurate, not 100% accurate. Um, and, you know, I want to bring us to the next thing, Melody, and I'm going to replace my picture with this data from Black Knight. Now, you and I already went over this. I just want to kind of go over this with the viewer. And I want to talk about essentially the, you know, five year period. And I'm going to circle that, which is basically from here to here. So 2008 to 2012. And I really want to talk about this data right here, because this is during the GFC. This is during basically the foreclosure crisis. And uh, I kind of want to talk about, if we can, Melody, 2010. So I'll start, you know, kind of put a star right there. Now, I've been hearing, again, a lot of bulls said 3 million homes hit the market 2010, and it, it flooded the house market with the inventory. But when we add all of this together, uh, first of all, you know, we can see here that the total foreclosure starts. So when we just look at this here, this is foreclosure starts, and I want to get your definition. There was le- a slightly over a million foreclosure starts during that five-year period. But also what's really fascinating, just so fascinating, is the homes out of the millions of people that had foreclosure filings, you know, there was only roughly 375,000 homes that were sold. That's it. And so, again, I want to point out to the viewers, let me zoom in here, okay? So here's the foreclosures right here. So 2.3 in 2010. But there was only starts. There was only 285,000 starts with sales being 79,000. Melody, can you help us understand, you know, and I know this is a little complicated, but what is the difference between what they're reporting as a foreclosure, not necessarily a filing, they're just saying foreclosure, versus a start? And, and, and why is there a huge gap between those two numbers? Yeah, so a lot was going on back then, including the states that came in. And, you know, like New Jersey was on hold, mm-hmm. I think, for almost five years. I can't remember exactly, or three, something like that. I mean, it was a crazy time. And so people would get referred to foreclosure, but they would be on hold uh, because of the state uh, would say, no, you know, there's a foreclosure moratorium. Um, as well as you had the consent orders that really started um, late 2010 into 2011, where servicers, even if the states were not on hold, servicers were not allowed to proceed. And they also had to continue to review borrowers for loss mitigation. You know, we called it the circle of hell because no matter what, you could have the same borrower get about to finish the foreclosure process uh, they'd send in a, an application and you would have to review them again. And back then we were doing full underwriting. They don't do that anymore for some of these mods. And so we would have to stop the process. And when you stop the process in many states, you have to you have to restart all over again once you pause that process, as well as their statute of limitations. So it's a lot of words, but ultimately there was so much on hold back then. And so you see that huge number, that's people that were in foreclosure But what was happening is they were being evaluated by the big five over and over again for loss mitigation, even though because the Fed forced them to, even if the borrowers couldn't qualify and just the state holds. And then you look at what a foreclosure start is, that's going to be that first legal filing as what we refer to in the industry. But if you're in a non-judicial state, that's going to be that notice of default filed with county records. If you're in a judicial state, that's going to be the complaint. Uh, the complaint, and then your completions are the actual completed uh, foreclosure sales. And and what you're pointing out, Travis, I think is a really good point because people say that the only way you're going to get a price correction is if uh, you know you have a for- foreclosure tsunami. Well, what we're seeing here, um, it, it it wasn't necessarily that all these foreclosures were hitting the market. What you're seeing instead is that. There was an affordability crisis due to people in distress and, you know, consumer distress and not being able to pay 
their mortgage. And so, you know, demand just was not there. And as you and I were just chatting, prices started coming down in January of 2007. Yes. And, and I just, and I calculated those numbers. So, you know, Mel and I looked and during the biggest period of price decline during the GFC, say from 2008, say to 2010. So 28, I mean, you know, 08, 09, 010, you know, there was only, you know, roughly a little over 200,000 foreclosed homes that were sold in that three year period of time when we had the highest price decline. So during the price decline of the GFC, a little over 200,000 homes were sold as foreclosure. And, and that brings me to my next question. You know, Melody, you know, don't, isn't it possible, and, and you alluded to this, that the bigger issue with the foreclosure crisis during the GFC was consumers' purchasing power was destroyed because remember, right. yes, eight, yes, 8 million people had a foreclosure filing. There was probably 10, 11 million people that had a 30-day late payment on their credit 30-day late payment destroys someone's purchasing power. So what if, it's crazy, the reality is we never had millions of homes that turned into foreclosed homes in, during that period of time. The real issue here was America got slammed and they got slammed You know, for, I'm going to just say, the job market, uh, unemployment. Now, I have this next question, all right? This is a little complicated. With the premise that during the GFC, according to Black Knight, which doesn't have the entire picture, there was about 373,000 homes sold during the GFC as a foreclosure. Right now, Melody, and let me pull this up for the viewers, and I, and I want your opinion on this, uh, and, and maybe they'll extend and pretend and extend, but right now, oh, first of all, we already had 9 million Americans went into forbearance, by the way, uh, and we kind of brought that forward, but right now we have about 320 thousand homes that are still in COVID forbearance. And these are people that have already had low rates, principal reduction, payment reduction. I mean, everything was thrown at them and they still can't get caught up. So isn't it possible that these 320,000 families, you know, can feed that foreclosure inventory, you know, at a similar pace as the GFC? Because again, if the real issue here was during the GFC consumers purchasing power, I mean, then the 300,000 foreclosures may not even be, you know, the real turning factor here. What is your opinion on the 320,000 families that are currently in COVID forbearance that cannot get out of it? I think that those borrowers, the 320,000 that are still in forbearance, they have probably the most runway. What I'm most, because they haven't taken the payment deferral yet. Once they get out of the forbearance, they'll be able to do the deferral. It's like a fresh start. But yes, down the line, these folks are going to be in trouble. What I'm more concerned, so I just finished delinquency reviews for my client books. And as I, I knew it, I could feel it. Um, that little seasonal toxin bonus catch up has just dissipated mm -hmm. completely. And I am seeing yeah. the highest 60 plus that I have seen since 2020 in my client books. This is a big deal, guys. And so I'm more concerned, actually, Travis, for all those people that exited forbearance, you know, those, what do you say, 9 million or whatever it was yep. that have already taken the payment deferral or they did a 40 year mod or if they were FHA, VA, they did the partial claim and then the mod um, that, that those are the people that I'm watching default right now. And, and I put out something yesterday on X Twitter about VA finally um, mm -hmm. approving their loss mitigation option where they're going to reduce, you know, um, them down to a 2.5% modification. And, and the fact is people are like, oh my gosh, but the reality is people can't even afford that. And that's what we're starting to see. I mean, property taxes and insurance yes. have increased astronomically for new buyers. It's, you know, those property taxes for new buyers are just insane. And when that loan was originated, they looked at the last year's property taxes. And even though the lender probably said, hey, these could go up, Nobody was expecting if the taxes were a thousand last year and then next year your taxes are fifteen thousand. People were not expecting that. And so I, I honestly, yes, in, in six to nine months, 12 months, those that are still in forbearance, they will enter into some other workout that they that probably won't keep them <laughs> afloat either. And by that time, likely, you know, we're gonna have some additional workout solutions. Um, but I, I think I want everyone to realize the percentage of all cash sales means that a lot of these are actually uh, 
you know, foreclosures are going to happen outside of the mortgage industry and the counties with delinquent taxes are going to be the ones this time that are going to be crushed by the foreclosure wave. And that's why the difference between Black Knight and Adam is so important because Adam is actually pulling off of public record where, and that's going to get your mortgage assets and then your assets that weren't mortgaged um, and your county taking that property to foreclosure for uh, property taxes, failure to pay. So I, my point is that we've got, we, we just had GFC style workout programs. That's what the last two years were. We, and, and we appropriately kicked the can. Uh, we are now, there are no options left uh, for many of these borrowers. And so by, I would say by June of 25, we are going to have a material, a material default population, unless they're, you know, the government comes in and does a debt jubilee or some, <laughs> something like that. Because even these modification programs, you can look at all the studies on HAMP. Uh, they did not help uh, the the people they promised to help. You know, they promised to help something like 8 million people. And it was more like, I believe, 3 million. There's some great Fed papers on it. Yeah. And honestly, you know, back to what you were saying about the, the property taxes and the homeowners insurance and how the new homeowners are really paying that, I would kind of, you know, point out Melody too, but the old homeowners are also feeling that. And they may be the biggest, like, at risk, right? Like, they, cause they're surprised. They're just minding their business and now their property taxes just tripled, right? There's reports now where people are being priced out of their house, meaning like they have, they're forced to sell because of property taxes uh, alone. And so like, especially these people on fixed income now, obviously a lot of homeowners can file their homestead. There are some counties that have a cap on the assessed value, but there's also people that they still don't know that a homestead exists, Melody. It's really sad. I, I see this all the time on uh, MLS where I, you know, they just don't file uh, their, their homestead or they're not uh, during their protest. So that is hurting. And then also what's interesting you pointed out with ATTOM, you know, it, you know, it is important to use both because I could see how looking at the public records is super helpful, but it's difficult when, when you do with non-disclosure states like Texas. That's been one of my frustrations moving to Texas from California. Like California, I could go into the title records and I could see people's interest rates, their taxes, when they purchased, all of that. And so, yeah, having various data providers is very important. And Melody, if I can, you know, you've been through a lot of process in regards to foreclosure. You went through GFC process as well. So you know loan modification is fairly new. Uh, I think it's important the viewers understand that there was moratorium during the GFC as well. Those foreclosures were not inventory. The bigger issue was probably the purchasing power uh, being slaughtered for, for Americans. Can you tell the viewers, Melody, in your expertise, what can we learn from the past? Well, you know, what can we learn from the past? I think what we can learn from the past and what I hope people are learning right now is pay attention. So I, I would say what you just said about people not knowing about the homestead exemption, not knowing they can go and, you know, uh, kind of actually argue against those taxes and get them reduced. I, I think that's that's important because there was a big article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday or the day before on exactly this topic that, you know, I've been talking about since October of 2022 um, of property taxes and insurance increasing and how people who are living on fixed incomes of like two thousand you know dollars social security benefits own their home and they're in jeopardy of losing you know their home and I was also reading some lending tree study today about forty one percent of homeowners uh, that home they own their home today uh, they they uh, they exist below the poverty line when it comes to their salary so you know, what, don't get over leveraged. That's, that's what we can learn. Uh, it might be too late for many, but for those that have gotten here, there are so many state programs to go out there uh, to save yourself if you are in this situation. Um, so I think, you know, in many ways, th this is <laughs> those government programs that make everything so expensive. They're also out there though, and helpful to people, people that can't pay their taxes. There's, there's, government assistance out for there out there as well. Um, but you know, honestly, what I learned 
most, Travis, is I cannot trust anything in the media. I cannot trust mm. what I'm being told. Uh, I and you know, right now we are being told the economy is doing great, and that is just absolute crap. That is not true, uh, you know. And people are like you and I say this. People are probably sick of it, but we've lost 1.8 million jobs in the last four months. Like. You know, uh, seniors, we've got homeless populations, you know, the biggest increases are for 55 plus. We've got, you know, record um, attendance at food banks. Like the economy is not great. The economy is great for the top 1%. And, and you know, maybe the top 10%, but the top 10% is also starting to fill it. So, you know, <laughs> what I learned is I cannot trust a single expert out there. And that is why, you know, you and I, why I started my journey, why you started your journey, why we're doing these boots on the ground uh, visits, because we know that what we're seeing in front of our eyes, you know, and what we see with little Trav, the drone, um, is completely, you know, it, it, it's in contradiction to what everyone is saying out there. And so that I think is the biggest lesson. I love it. I mean, so basically just to reiterate that, you know, pay attention and don't trust the media. And also I think what in all fairness, Melody too, because we, you know, we got to look at both sides of the coin. There's also people on our sides of the coin that are warning people, but like they're doing it for bad intentions, right? There's some type mm -hmm. of financial incentive. So, you know, what I'm trying to say guys is don't stay stuck on anyone's narrative. No one's going to know what to do, what's the right thing to do better than you are. And no one's going to care about your investment, including me and Melody, like you, because we're not you. you. We want you to do well, but you care more. And so mm -hmm. in that, you know, I say just pay attention, continue to rebudget, you know, be patient, understand that what's going on right now is not normal. It's going on right now because things are broken. They got broken through lockdowns. We know that inflation, money printing. And so it takes time. And so we have to be patient and uh, patience is the virtue. And so if I, if I can, Melody, we kind of just close this out here and you've already said some great insights, but can you just close on, you know, maybe just some parting words to the consumer that's on the sidelines, just frustrated, like, oh my God, I missed my opportunity. I'm never going to own a home again. I should give up and just go have fun and go to the Taylor Swift concert that's coming into town next weekend. Don't do it, guys. Don't do it. Like we are about to, in my opinion, and I hope to God I'm actually wrong. Like I really do. <laughs> but in my opinion, we're about to enter some of the worst economic, the worst economic times of my lifetime. And I went through the GFC and I was around, uh, I was very, I was a baby, but I was around for, you know, inflation. Um, I, so mm. This is, this is going to be bad and you are going to wish more than anything that you had not, you know, destroyed your purchasing power because there are going to be opportunities. And so if you don't go to that Taylor Swift concert today and you put that in the bank and you or you know, a money market fund or a treasury and you just stay consistent, you will have an opportunity in the next couple of years. I firmly, I really do believe that. And if, and if it doesn't happen, then there's probably gonna be a civil war because you just cannot have this level of inequality. It just, it, people will not stand for it. Um, mm. and, and they're not gonna stand for it when, you know, free money is be, being given to immigrants while, you know, uh, our, our folks are starving. I mean, in these and in homeless shelters, et cetera. I mean, so there, there's just going to come and, uh, you know, and I know immigration is politically sensitive, but we have to, we have to accept it's happened. Like we, we have to accept, yeah. accept that these people are here. These government programs are happening. And so I just believe that this is going to get more and more contentious. We're going to hear more and more about it. And it's going to be one of the top issues for the election. So, you know, I just don't see, how this path we're on uh, of unaffordability is sustainable. And so please, please don't take on new debt. Please don't. <laughs> this is the time when if you're debt free, you're going to be doing so much better. Uh, credit card delinquencies just hit all time highs. Mm -hmm. You know, those folks, those people that maybe use their credit card to, to buy that Taylor Swift purchase, they're going to destroy our concert ticket. They're going to destroy their purchasing power. They're going to destroy their ability to get a mortgage in two years when the time is right. Yeah, I mean, so your, I don't know how long they are, your two-hour Taylor Swift concert or 
uh, you know, a home you can retire in, be a millionaire. Taylor Swift, two hours, retire comfortably. You know, it's up to you. I think that's a great words, Melody. And, you know, you guys don't forget to go to her channel, go to her Substack, show her some love. She took her time to, you know, enlighten us, share her insights, her perspective. She's very busy. Melody, thank you. I'm going to get us out of here. Now, obviously, guys, if you're out there investing in real estate, you guys already know what we want to say, which is slow your roll. And we hope you win.